supposed to know which is the right career for us? If we're to spend 40 to 50 hours a week, over 10,000 hours a year, we're going to want to choose a career that we're best at and one that we love. And with the average American changing their jobs up to seven times during their lifetime, finding the right career as soon as possible will contribute to better health and help you live a richer and fuller life. The right career is out there waiting for you, and I'm going to help you find it. I'm Freddie Cochran. Welcome to California Careers. Welcome to another edition of California Careers. I'm Freddie Cochran, your host. We're in Long Beach, California today with attorney Janet Dockstetter. Hello, Janet. Hi, Freddie. Hi, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate that. Good deal. What exactly is a family law lawyer? Well, we're attorneys that deal with mainly divorce issues, some paternity action, mm -hmm. and domestic violence issues. Okay, so you guys are exclusively fam family law in this office? We are. Okay. And there's how many, how many attorneys are here? We have seven. Seven attorneys, okay. Um, let's go through what education is required to become a lawyer? Well, I think most ABA approved schools, law schools, want you to have a four-year degree. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you go to law school and you receive your Juris Doctor. Okay. And then you take the state bar, the California State Bar. Okay, so one out of high school gets into um, a college. Can that be a junior college or, or a four-year school? Does it matter what college we go to? Right out of high school? Yeah. No, it certainly doesn't matter where you start your career path, mm -hmm. but ultimately the degree and your graduating will decide what law school you're going to be admitted to. Of course, the better grades you have in college and the more prestigious college you went to, the the better law school you'll probably be admitted to. Okay, that's good advice. We want to make sure that we keep our grades high, our cumulative GPA high, so we have a better chance of getting into the law school of our choice. That's true. Uh, we're still, uh, let's say, we're still um, as a four-year bachelor's degree. Can that degree be in anything, is that right? To get into law school? It, it can be anything. Any major? Any major. Okay, we just, uh, the goal is to graduate, right? And to keep your, your grades high. Yeah, I mean, with that said, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not on the committee that admits students into the law schools, but right. my understanding is it can really be in any area as long as you have your degree. Okay, good deal. Uh, once we finish law school, is there, um, there's there a test we need to take to get into law school, the LSAT? Is there, right? there is the LSAT. Okay, what is that test? What, what are we doing there? Uh, well, the LSAT is a test that, um, it's an analytical test if I recall correctly. It's been some time since I took it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very similar mm -hmm. to the SAT, if I remember okay. correctly, when you're in high school. Mm -hmm. I think it's a critical thinking, um, reading comprehension, that, that type of stuff. Absolutely. Thanks okay. for that. Yeah. Um, so we get a score on that sucker. So now we've got a bachelor's degree, we've got an LSAT score, and now we apply to law school. Well, right. And that is okay. actually very important because mm -hmm. your LSAT score combined with your GPA is what's going to determine whether the school of your choice admits you. Good deal. Um, any other bennies that we need? Maybe letters of recommendation, a resume to get that package together to get into the law school of our choice that you might recommend? Well, th that is actually very important. When mm -hmm. I was applying for law school, I remember looking at some different schools and talking to some different deans, mm -hmm. and the advice that I got was to look at what the school really wanted. So mm -hmm. one school in particular, I remember, loved having politicians coming out of their school. Oh, wow. And okay. so they thought for kids who want to go to that particular law school, it would be very beneficial for them to really volunteer some, some time with the local politicians. I love it. Um, investigate the school of your choice. See what it is that uh, can help your chances of getting in. Certainly doesn't hurt. All right. Good deal. Let's say, uh, let's talk about law school for a moment. What are they teaching us in there? How long is it and what's going on in there? Well, law school can be three or four years. Mm -hmm. If you're in the daytime program, which is full time generally, mm -hmm. then it's a three year program. Mm -hmm. If you take the evening program, which is ideal for those who need to work, mm -hmm then it's a four-year program. Okay. And um, that's what I'm familiar with. I, mm -hmm. I don't know what other options are out there. There may be some other options, but mm -hmm. those are the ones that I generally hear. Okay, about. I'm curious, where did you go to school? I went to Loyola Law School in Loyola. LA. Okay, what about undergrad? UC Santa Barbara. Wow, okay, big schools. Big schools. Wow, okay, were you like the fraternity girl? Is it like party time or was it just strictly do you have to put your head down? Is it is it grueling the uh, <laughs> the experience? <or? laughs> I have is there time for beers at night or? <laughs> um, I was a sorority girl. You were? Okay. I was. Right I on. was. I enjoyed UC Santa Barbara very much. Go Gauchos! Right, right, yeah. <laughs> and, and Pi Phi's at the time was, All right. uh, was the sorority I was in. Uh -huh. And so um, very much enjoyed it. Did not have the degree that I would have really liked to have had, but my LSAT score really made up for that. Oh, right on. How did you prepare, prepare for that exam? I'm curious. 
Yeah, I took the Kaplan review. You did, okay. I thought that was vital. Okay, mm -hmm. good deal. Um, now, law school itself, it's either three or four years. Um, is it as, as terrible as all the horror stories are out there? Or can you touch on uh, the, the law school experience? Yeah, isn't that funny? There's a movie called The Paper Chase. Okay. And when I first started law school, they recommended that we watch that. And it was really on point. It's, it's terrifying. You start mm -hmm. law school and you think that you're relatively smart. Mm -hmm. And now you're in a class of 100 or more people who are all smart. Mm -hmm. Many are smarter than you. All of a sudden you realize that you're not as bright as you thought you were. And the teacher literally says the first day of school, look to your left, look to your right. One of them isn't going to be here next semester. Oh, man, that's scary. It is. It's scary. Oh, man. It look is. right here. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so that first year is really very challenging, daunting, scary. Um, there's a lot of emotions that you go through that first year. Mm -hmm. But truly, if you can get through that first year of law school, mm -hmm. it is so much easier and you just realize that you fit and it works and it's not that hard wow. and you're so glad when you can stick it out. Wow, very cool. Right on. Let's say we get through law school. Let's talk about the bar exam. What is that sucker? How do we, how do we prepare for that sucker? Does, does law school actually prepare you for the exam or do we need to take sort of a, a prep course for the exam? Well, to some degree law school prepares you for the exam, mm -hmm. but a prep course is vital, vital. And as far as describing the exam, it is more terrifying than your first year of law school. <laughs> oh, great. Honestly. <laughs> in California, our exam is three days long, mm -hmm. and I think it's six hours a day. You have a lunch break in there. Mm -hmm. But I think substantively you are at that desk okay. filling out your test exam for six hours, I believe. Wow. Um, that is more than any other state in the nation, as I recall. Okay. In New York, I think it's two days, and they are supposed to be almost as hard as California, but we are known as having really the hardest exam to pass. Wow. So with that said, the first day of the bar exam, it's really, it's really a crack up because mm -hmm. you end up having this line to the bathroom because everybody just feels like they're going to be sick any minute. <laughs> I mean, it's just a big joke and we all laugh about it after the fact, but, wow. but that first, second and third day of that exam, it's intense. Wow, 18 hours of an exam to become a lawyer, right? So we need eight years of higher education, 18 hours of the bar exam, any other requirements? Isn't there a moral character background check and a professional responsibility exam? Maybe there, there is. There's mm -hmm. a, there is all of that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So we got those hoops to jump through. Let's say we become, we get our license. We're an official lawyer. How do we get a job? What, what do we do? Uh, is there internships available? Do we just go pound the pavement with our, with our new bar card? Or well, mm -hmm. that, that's interesting. I mean, mm -hmm. for me, I think what is really important is when you're in law school that you really open up every door that you can peek your head in, kind of, because you end up with this law degree, but there are so many different areas of the law, and you really have to be true to yourself. I think you really have to have that conversation with yourself, figuring out who you are, what you're good at, what mm -hmm. you're not good at, mm -hmm. and, and really kind of define where you want to be. Mm -hmm. And then once you start doing that, you start looking at different areas of practice, and yes, I think you send out your resumes and you see if you can offer your time to go in and to kind of fill it out and see if if that is sexy enough for you. Okay. And, um, and once you decide your fit, then I think when you're graduating, you hope to have some interviews lined up through your school and have the opportunity to show your stuff and hopefully be offered a job after you pass the bar. Good deal. So in your school at Loyola or, or I'm sure at other law schools, there's like a career development center that prepares you for the workforce that you would check in with, sort of explore the employment opportunities before you get out there? That, that okay. is absolutely true, and I'm so okay. glad you did your homework because I wouldn't remember most of this stuff, oh, but, <laughs> but absolutely. And that, that Career Development Center is really very important to utilize when you're mm -hmm. a student. Okay, mm -hmm. good deal. I know um, uh, as a professional in, in the legal field myself, um, Craigslist was always a big help. Um, different um, newsletters up north, it was the recorder. In the back of a news, the newspaper were, were job advertisements. Um, pound in the pavement might be another option. Well, it's absolutely an option, mm -hmm. but knowing somebody that will help you either get a job in their, in their office or in an office that they know and that they can recommend is really an ideal situation for somebody. Mm -hmm. And that's why when you're in law school, I think reaching out and making as many connections as you can mm -hmm. is really very important. And look, it doesn't have to be with an attorney's office. It could be with a local politician or somebody else who who is familiar with the attorneys in the area and can really help you open some doors. 
I like that. Um, I, I've heard um, some of my colleagues have gone on to television or baseball or journalism, um, not necessarily the law. It sort of uh, prepares you for different types of careers, um, right. not necessarily. It, was that your experience? Um, do you know any colleagues that, that actually branched out into other areas besides the law? Or, or almost everyone s stayed in the legal game? Oh gosh, I'm trying to think. I think everybody that I stayed in touch with stayed in the legal game. Mm -hmm. um, but you certainly can branch out. And when I, first, when I first went to get my degree, it wasn't to practice law. I had no desire to practice law. Wow. And so uh, for me, it was just knowing that it was really a very impressive degree to have. And whether you want to become the vice president of a bank mm -hmm. or you want to, um, you know, I, I don't know what, I can't think of something else right now, but mm -hmm. whatever it is business-wise, you are really making a statement when you have your law degree. I agree, yeah, it prepares you for a diverse range of, of careers. Right. Very cool. Let's talk about a typical day as a family law lawyer. What, what are you guys doing around here? Well, a typical day for me would be going to court in the morning. Um, that could be just something to, you know, a quick, a quick appearance to set a trial date, mm -hmm. or it could mean a very contentious and complicated hearing. Mm -hmm. So I can be there 15 minutes, or I could be there all day. Wow. If I come back to the office, then I'm generally meeting with clients and trying to prepa prepare paperwork mm -hmm. um, for the cases that I know I'm going to be appearing on soon. Okay, let's talk about a typical case. Is it um, exclusively family law? So we're dealing with like maybe divorce or uh, the distribution of assets on the divorce, the custody issues. That's right. The restraining order with the crazy, crazy husband type of stuff. Right, that's right. right? It's that's exciting. Right. It, well, it can be exciting. <laughs> it can, it, it really, it Drama. Can, there's drama. I used to say it's really good dinner conversation. Okay. Because it used to just be so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and if I, I guess if I sat down with somebody now and shared some of my stories, they would, they would still raise their eyebrows and say, really, that, that happens? But it, it does, you know, you see really people's lives mm -hmm. and how, how crazy we all are. Right. And you're in it, you know, you're their advocate. That's an so. emotional, emotional deal. I mean, love and with, with marriage, I mean, is enough. And then to have to break it off and distribute the property, does it ever get just so hectic that you're just like, ah. Well, I don't know if distributing property is really the, the more emotional part of it. Mm -hmm. I think child custody can be okay. really quite emotional, mm -hmm. um, especially if you have some facts that just are not your normal facts that you, s you would think of in a typical mm -hmm. marriage. Mm -hmm. um, domestic violence issues, you mm -hmm. know, somebody makes the claim, he pushed me, mm -hmm. there's no marks on the body, and all of a sudden you're in this litigation for a domestic violence restraining order. Wow. That affects your family law case. Mm -hmm and then potentially has a criminal charge with it. So wow. then you end up in criminal courts. Mm -hmm. And then if there is an injury, perhaps there's a civil claim filed. Wow, okay. Still on the day-to-day -day activities as, as a family law attorney. So generally we're in court most of the day. Well, that's for me. I mean, okay. I, I'm a litigator, but mm -hmm. we have attorneys in the office who really are research attorneys. They're mm -hmm. fantastic. They write our motions, they do the research. And so they're in the office on a daily basis. That's okay. just not, that's not, the position that I hold here. Okay. Um, you mentioned you're a litigator. What is a litigator? What does that mean? Well, it means that I'm in court. Okay. So I'm, I'm the one who goes to court, one of the, the few that go to court and mm -hmm. will argue the case, present the facts to the court. Mm -hmm. um, that's my job. Okay. Um, so in other words, the litigation is sort of um, like a football kickoff in a football game. It's the start of the complaint all the way through to the decision. Is that right? The litigation. Well, that's the litigation part, okay. yes. And you being a litigator would be in, in court advocating that proceeding? That, that's correct. Okay, good deal. So typical day, um, you're generally in court. Um, when, do you, when do you meet with clients or when do you write complaints and all those goodies? Is that afternoons or? Yes, well first in family law, we mm -hmm. file a summons and a petition, okay. so it's not a complaint. Okay. Um, and when I meet with my clients is typically in the afternoon. However, if we know that I'm not in court in the morning or perhaps I'm in court in the afternoon and here in the morning, then mm -hmm. We just fit the clients in when we can. Okay. Um, so are you generally meeting with a team, like maybe assistants that help you with research or, or any other goodies, maybe a paralegal or a legal assistant Absolutely. during your day? Absolutely. How do, those, how do those guys help you out? They are, they are the nuts and bolts of my practice. Really? So okay. Yeah, they are vital to what I do. So what happens is I meet with a client. As soon as the client leaves, 
I have prepared a status memo as to what needs to be done and what our strategy is going to be. Mm -hmm. And my two assistants that will be on the case will come in and we will talk about what needs to be done and how timely it needs to be done. Okay. And what research perhaps needs to be done. Okay. And then that starts us off. Good deal. Um, how many types or, or how many clients does, say, one attorney have generally? Is it like five clients, a hundred clients? How many would, do you have at this particular time? Uh, you would think I would know that. I, I think Ballpark. I probably have somewhere between 50 and 70. Wow. But what you have to remember mm -hmm. is that they're not all in the midst of litigation right now. Okay. So some of them, we have already gone through the litigation, mm -hmm. and there's just some loose ends to be tied up. Mm -hmm. Some, we've gone through the litigation, and perhaps there are post-judgment modifications that are being done. Mm -hmm. So they come back to have me reopen an issue. Um, and then you have the ones that really the clients come in and they say, we know this is good for us to divorce. We just want to mediate the issues. Mm -hmm. We have an agreement in place. And mm -hmm. I'm really just to kind of help them define their agreement, figure out what really is in their best interest. Okay inform them as to their rights and their obligations so that they can both feel good about the agreement that they've put together. Okay. And we follow that through the court system. Very cool. Is, is a family law matter, is it, is it ever completely settled or is it always um, a temporary sort of injunctive relief? No, no. Is we have, in family law, you, <laughs> you reach a judgment and so you mm -hmm. may have temporary orders in place, mm -hmm. but ultimately the goal for all of us is mm -hmm. to have a judgment in place. Now the issue then is, is can you revisit any issues if mm -hmm. you have a judgment in place? And, and you can in family law on certain issues. Okay. So for instance, child custody. Mm -hmm. You can always revisit the issue of child custody for good cause okay. um, until the youngest child turns 18. Okay. And same with child support mm -hmm. and, um, and some other issues. Spousal support if the facts warrant mm -hmm. a, a modification of spousal support and if the court still has jurisdiction on that issue. Oh, very cool. So if until the children are 18, it's a sort of fair game for, for either side, it sounds like. Yes. Right? <laughs> that's, okay. That's a funny way to say it, but maybe so. Okay. How, how would you sort of re-say that? What, what am I missing on that? Well, because it's not fair game. I mean, mm -hmm. parents can, unfortunately, play games mm -hmm. regarding child custody. But once a child turns about the age of 14 years old, mm -hmm. there's not a whole lot the parents can do anymore. In some really? situations they can, mm -hmm. but oftentimes when a 14 or a 15 year old says, I'm out of here, I'm gonna go live over here, mm -hmm. it is very difficult to get that child back into the home where they don't wanna be, unless for good cause. Really? So those circumstances do exist where you can show that's not the right environment for the child. Mm -hmm. but, but at that age, it's a little bit higher of a burden. The kids start to have an opinion that will be heard by the court. Really? And so it's not just the parents now playing wow. a game. I don't even like to say they're playing a game, but it's not mm -hmm. just the parents fight anymore. The kids get to be a little bit involved. Wow, that's very interesting. Um, the children, I, I can see how moving from, from maybe with your mom over to your dad could be disturbing. It could, you know, sort of, um, and just be so emotional for a child, so they, they do have a say. It's, is that right? They, they do. They, it's, it's not as though if you litigate the case, I don't want somebody to hear this and to mm -hmm. think that a decision is made in the child's eight, and right. now that eight-year-old is 14 and gets to say, I'm, I'm moving out, mm -hmm. or that the parent gets to tell the 14-year-old, if you want to come live with me, just tell mom and you can do that. Okay. I, I'm not trying <laughs> right? to, okay. I'm not trying mm -hmm. to um, set the stage for that, okay. but, but some cases, the circumstances are such mm -hmm. that the teenager wants to have a say. Mm -hmm. And when that's the case, the courts will allow them to have a say. That doesn't mean the court will directly talk with that 14-year-old, but the 14-year-old gets to have a voice somehow heard by the court. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is that voice, is that typically in court uttered in, mm -hmm. in person, or is that generally an affidavit on paper for the, for the child? Or are they actually in court with their mom and dad? Well, that's a question that everybody's really talking about right now. Mm -hmm. um, the law provides that when you're 14 and older, you get to have your voice heard if you desire. Wow. But the judges are looking at that as though it can be very harmful. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I should say many judges are looking at that okay. as though that could be harmful to a child because a 14-year-old at that moment could feel they really don't want to live with that one parent. But you put that, that kid in court and they say those words in front of that parent it can be very damaging to that relationship long term. Okay. So we really try to avoid that, which means typically we'll assign an attorney, the court will assign an attorney to that child. We call that minor's counsel. Wow. 
Um, that, that's one way a challenge can be heard. Mm -hmm. Who pays for that? Is that his Typ the, the parties typically will share the cost of minors' counsel. Oh, wow, that's interesting. You had mentioned earlier um, that circumstances could, could change between a parent um, and the child, that the custody could actually move to the other side. I'm curious, what type of situation would circumstances change enough to provide um, a decree to move custody over? Well, like if he got a job or something, I don't know. No, no, no. Well, if the question <laughs> is, is what could happen in the household okay. to have the other parent now want to go and seek custody, okay. then many things can happen in the household. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the, the ex, the custodial parent, remarries. Mm -hmm. and the new spouse doesn't have a good relationship with the child or children. Okay. That's, that's one situation. I mean, there huh. are just numerous situations that can arise okay. where the non-custodial or visiting parent has concerns and wants to go back to court to win custody. Okay. Is it typically um, a restraining order situation between the parents, or is it generally um, modified in, in uh, a more diplomatic matter? Is it is it, um, does that make sense? No, it, it does. Mm -hmm. I, I understand the question. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the answer is no, it, it's quite typical for somebody to file a modification mm -hmm. of a visitation at the very least. Maybe not mm -hmm. custody, mm -hmm. because custody we can continue to say it's joint custody or whatever it is. But really, if you're looking for a different timeshare, mm -hmm. it's typical for a non custodial parent to request an order that a change be made for okay. various reasons. Now, if the judge uh, believes that maybe one of the parents could be harmful to their child, is it, is it a court liaison appointed to sort of oversee him interacting with his, with his children or her interacting with his children? Well, sometimes, and so there's a couple of different avenues you can take as an attorney. We will look at the facts and try and figure out what's best for this family. Mm -hmm. um, the courts do provide a system that's called different things at the various courthouses in the different counties, but typically they provide a system where a social worker will meet with the parents in the morning and with the children, if the children are old enough to, to communicate with the evaluator in a, in a way that they understand what they're saying. Um, and then the social worker will go to court at 1.30 and tell the judge what their recommendations are based on what they learned. Okay. So that's kind of a cheap and quick way to do it. Mm -hmm cheaper, cheap is relative, mm -hmm. it's cheaper, but a more comprehensive way is we have a 730 evaluator assigned to the case, so we have an evaluation done. Mm -hmm. We say 730 because it's under the evidence code, 730, oh, okay. um, where an expert is appointed to the case, and that person is qualified to, to really determine what's in the best interest of the children after looking, looking at all the factors. Those factors can include talking, will include talking to the parents, Mm -hmm. talking to the children, watching people interact. Perhaps it's a home visit. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's talking to the medical providers, the counselors, the school, the teachers. Wow. Um, really kind of trying to get an overview of the whole picture. Mm -hmm. And then that evaluator will write a report for us to see. Mm -hmm. And that will help us determine how we're going to settle the case or if we need to litigate the issue. Wow, sounds comprehensive, for sure. It's comprehensive. Wow, okay. You know what sounds... Um, just sad that um, maybe a parent would have to, you know, or, or the kids would have to interact with the, a government person in their, you know, in their lives as a as a kid. Um, that just it sounds it sounds sad. How, does that ever come up? I mean, just the emotions. How, how do you feel about that? I mean, well, it's really a good point, and mm -hmm. what I think people need to remember when they're in the midst of a divorce and emotions are raw mm -hmm. and high is that you are putting your kids through a lot. Mm -hmm. And so what we can see oftentimes is somebody will make an allegation that borders on maybe criminal conduct or not, you're not really sure. Maybe the facts aren't there to support the allegation being made. Yeah. But because that one parent calls Child Protective Services and calls the police wow. and goes to court and makes the allegation, all of a sudden you have all of these authoritative figures talking to your children which sometimes is needed. So I would never want to dissuade somebody from doing that when it's needed. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have the facts to support what you're going to say, then certainly you should think twice before you make those calls and subject the kids to those interviews. There might be a better way to do it. And that's where you really need to sit down with counsel and figure out what's really best for this child because that can be just emotionally breaking to a child. And they're mm -hmm. going to remember that for the rest of their right. lives. Wow. 
Um, how does one, um, if money's tight, how does one go about, you know, getting your services? How, how does one go about acquiring the services of a private family law lawyer? It's really hard. Mm -hmm. It really is. Are there other avenues out there, uh, monies that uh, are available that we can apply for? No. No. There okay. are um, a couple of. There are a couple of organizations like the Harriet Buhai Foundation mm -hmm. um, and a couple of others whose names escape me right now, mm -hmm. but they will take cases for free or maybe on a sliding scale mm -hmm. if the facts warrant it, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I know Harriet Buhai is very helpful with domestic violence cases, mm -hmm. but not it's, it's not that easy to always get their services. I think mm -hmm. certainly people should try when they can't afford to have an attorney. Mm -hmm. But if you do not qualify, then it really is very tough to find private counsel. Wow. Of course, private counsel, you know, we range in our hourly rates. So mm -hmm. you have to look around and see, see which attorney really fits your budget mm -hmm. and provides you the kind of representation you need to have. Since this is a civil matter and not a criminal matter, there are is no government um, public defender type of situation. No, you're not appointed an attorney. Okay. Let's switch gears for a minute. Um, what, what do you love about being, I know that this kind of drained into the, the bad side of, of being, but what, what's fabulous about this career? What do you love about being a lawyer, family law lawyer? Well, I love, honestly, on a personal level, I love knowing my rights. Okay. I do, I love that. Mm -hmm. You know, I love that when we're having construction done and I say I'm an attorney right away, a red flag goes up to the, to the construction yes. worker, to the that contractor cool. that, they, you know, they're not gonna, Whoa. take advantage of me and I'm going to review the contract. There's a real benefit to that. Okay. Um, but in terms of the day-to-day -day being an attorney, I don't know if I can speak for all attorneys because practices are so different. Mm -hmm. For what I do, I think there's a real benefit to being able to help people. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's really it. I mean, and, and the other thing about being an attorney is well, it's more about being a self-employed attorney, I think. Mm -hmm. Should I respond on that? Point? Sure, yeah. <laughs> well, I think when you, you know, when I'm saying be true to yourself, really I kind of mean wh where do you find, where do you want to find yourself? Because if you are self-employed ultimately, you have a lot of responsibility, but you're not, you're not having to account for your time to anybody but yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go to a doctor's appointment, you can do that. Mm -hmm. If you want to leave early because your kids have back to school night, you can do that. Mm -hmm. There's a real benefit to that. But the detriment is that you are going to be responsible for your work and having to oversee everything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, yeah. I'm sorry, I was going to say, uh, it sounds like you know, the family law lawyers are, are making these kids' life safer, maybe healthier, um, you know, as opposed to like a vigilante type of situation. At least you guys are advocating for the future to have these kids live a richer, fuller, healthier, safer life, right? We should be. That, should that's be. the goal. We should be looking to the best interest of the kids mm -hmm. as we advocate for our clients. Yeah, that sounds like a, a very cool, cool spot. Changing lives for the better, helping people. Um, what is not so fabulous about this career, if anything? The cons of this game. Well, the cons is that mm -hmm. it's just so emotional. So you're almost, mm -hmm. you're almost a quasi-counselor, mm -hmm. which you have to remind your clients that's, that's really not your expertise. Mm -hmm. But it's hard for people to remember that because you're their advocate and mm -hmm. they need to talk to somebody and so there's a real balance there. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a, an emotional side of a family law lawyer. These guys are coming here not on their best day, right? It's kind of right. like the worst days of their life, the worst times of their life and it's like, ah, help me. So it sounds very emotionally. Can you sleep at night? Does your work go home with you? Or no, I can sleep at night. You can? I can. Good, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Does it ever affect you outside of the office at all or anything? Well, maybe a little bit, only because, yeah. you know, <clears throat> it's, it's what you've just said, that mm -hmm. people, even the best people, we all have kind of this ugly, crazy side to us. Mm -hmm. And here we are facing a divorce that maybe we don't want. Mm -hmm. And now we're having to divide the home of our children mm -hmm. and perhaps lose a significant amount of income that we're just accustomed to having. Mm -hmm. And so it is very hard for people to not let that that emotional side, that ugly side, that yeah. almost crazy side come out and take control because you are just so distraught. You're, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're at the bottom at that, during that moment. And it's challenging to get through for people and mm -hmm. we have to help them get through that as well as we can. Yeah, yeah it sounds like the, the clients could, could feel a range of different emotions, humiliated or just, um, just angry, um, 
just so many emotions that sounds like it might be a concern for, for this career. Right. right. Okay. Good deal. Let's switch gears for a minute. Let's talk about the good stuff, money. Let's talk yeah. about the big money you guys are making in this fabulous office here. What is the ballpark, not necessarily um, you per se, but um, a first year attorney, let's say that they come into the, the civil side or the family side of the lawyer game, what type of ballpark salary are we looking at? To make? Oh gosh, coming out of school, I don't know what the average is, but okay. I think in the, in the firm our size or bigger, you're looking at 120 starting. Okay, and these guys are working, is it true, the horror stories, the 60, 70 hours a week, or can I get out here in 40 hours? When well, I pass the bar and come here looking for a job, like, Janet, remember me? Well, I don't think you can get out in 40 hours, but you're not, at this firm, you're not working the 60 or 80 hours that I hear other firms are demanding, I think more of a civil law firm. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of the family law firms demand that. Mm -hmm. That isn't our experience, we would like to demand that. Mm -hmm. But I'm not willing to do that, so it's hard to. <laughs> okay. It's hard to demand that of others. Okay. Um, as time goes on, um, can we expect maybe, I don't know, like a 5% per year type of increase or how does that work? Is that depending on the success of the individual law firm probably? Well, it, it absolutely depends mm -hmm. on the success of the individual law firm. Okay. Good deal. Um, what about Benny's? Do you guys, uh, do you provide benefits for your associates, like health and dental and all those goodies? We do. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now if I graduate law school and I'm looking for a job, would you recommend coming to work for, for a firm like yourself or would, can I go out and just open up my own shingle and say law offices of Freddie Cochran? Uh, is that possible? Well, it's possible. I don't think it's that smart, okay. honestly, because the learning curve is so high. There's so mm -hmm. much you don't know when you come out of law school. Mm -hmm. And so I think you really need that mentor. Okay. Um, my experience was really almost just that. Mm -hmm. And so I knew enough to really latch on to some attorneys that I thought were dynamite in the area and just start going to court with them so I could learn. But honestly, ideally, I think the road to take is to go work for something like, for an outfit like the DA's office. Oh, really? Okay. The resources that they have and the support system, I think, is just really probably incomparable to any other outfit. You are learning your evidence and wow. you are learning um, how, how to appear in court, mm -hmm. how to be effective, mm -hmm. how to prepare your arguments. I really think that is probably the best training you can have. Right. That is just from watching in court. I have no experience with it, but from what I see and the attorneys I talk to, that, that seems to be a common thought. Wow, very cool, good advice. Start with government, go from there. Um, we always end with a funny story of some kind. Did something funny happen under this, this roof as a lawyer that you can share with us? <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I can't really think of anything funny, mm -hmm. but you know what I can say is, is that this career, especially family law, really lends itself to interesting interesting stories. I mean, okay. we really see people's lives, their real stories of what people are really going through. And, you know, I've, I've seen from a, a big burly man coming into my office to retain me. By the time we finish his case, he's a lovely woman who had <laughs> a surgery performed and, um, and is still, you know, fighting for custody of his child who he loves dearly, or wow. who she loves dearly. I'm sorry, <laughs> that was that was a slip up. Because truly, she's a a, a, a beautiful woman now, and and wow. um, and deserves to be respected for me to call her a she. Oh my gosh! So is that a, a transsexual? Is that what the term is for that? Transsexual. Right. Okay. Um, and that actually came up inside family law litigation. It that, did. That issue. It did. It did. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That must have been super interesting. You know. Did he actually come in as the man and leave as the woman later on? Not the same day. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Right. And he was burly before, and then now he's just a burly chick. He was a, he, he he had the appearance of a man's man, and felt the right decision for for him was to make the change, and he did that. Yeah. And you know, I I hope that she's very happy now. But my right. point being mm -hmm. is that you really see these interesting stories and, mm -hmm. and clients, you connect with them and they tell you the ins and outs of their lives. And, and I learned a lot going through that case and it was really quite fascinating. And I can now have a respect for somebody who's had to go through that that maybe I wouldn't have appreciated before. But you know, maybe that was a funny example. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are many examples of things that I am listening to and I think this is their life, and don't judge it, and just have a straight face. But, but it really, it, it, you have to pause because you just 
can't believe what happens in people's lives until you hear it and see it. And this is coming from a person who thought I grew up in a crazy family, but <laughs> being in this career, you realize it wasn't that crazy. Maybe not that crazy. Not okay. That crazy. Janet, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Do you have any advice for young people you want to share before we wrap it up? Well, I, I would really say truly have that conversation with yourself where you are true to yourself about who you are. If you are somebody who likes people and likes to talk and likes to be in front of a, of, likes to be on stage or in front of an audience, then you're really a litigator. If you are somebody who likes to cross your T's and dot your I's and is very happy shuffling paperwork, then you would never be comfortable in court, <clears throat> and you probably shouldn't pick that path. But you can still be a dynamite attorney who writes the motions and does the research and find yourself much happier because you're being true to who you are. Right on. There you have it, how to become a family law lawyer. Janet, thank you for joining us. Well, there you have it, how to become a family law lawyer. I want to thank Janet Dockstetter for joining us today here in Long Beach, California, outside the World Trade Center. This is Freddie Cochran for California Careers. Take care.